Uh, welcome to the David Ramsey Map Center. Uh, my name is G. Salim Muhammad. I am head and curator of the center. I'd like to welcome you to um, the uh, third of uh, four public talks un under the auspices of the Under Map Spaces workshop that is happening all week. Uh, the last of the public talks will be tomorrow at the same time as today, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, when we will have Alex Jill speak. Um, but before I formally introduce today's speaker, a small bit of housekeeping. Uh, please add your questions as you think of them in the Q&A box. Uh, we will get to them at the very end. Um, uh, chat is open, so you can communicate with us this way, and really with each other. Uh, we have two uh, Rumsey team members on uh, staff. Uh, today, Tyler Mitchell, our Center of Services Supervisor, and Chris, uh, Christina Larson, our new Assistant Rare Map Librarian. Uh, you will hear from them uh, via chat. So uh, on to today's speaker. I am delighted to introduce Majd Al-Shihabi. Uh, Majd, is, uh, Majd is a technologist and urban planner and a PhD student in the geography department at the University of Toronto. Majd's uh, current research is on the use of agent-based modeling to address the wicked problem of the housing crisis and is the co-founder of Palestine Open Maps. Uh, today, he is gonna talk about open data uh, where he interrogates the view that openness could easily turn into an extractive exercise that enforces exploitative dynamics. His talk will illustrate answers to the following question. What considerations do people working with open data have to take into account while working with open spatial data. So without further ado, Majid, the, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Salim. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Everyone can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you for inviting me and for uh, uh, and thanks to everyone uh, who's involved in organizing this first, of course, the first the under map spaces uh, team, uh, Chloe, Kelsey, and Riley, but also the Brenner's uh, library and uh, uh, and all of the Stanford libraries, and of course the David Ramsey Map Center. Uh, I used the, the the archive a lot in my own uh, research, and I am excited to actually be uh, like joining it in a different way. Um, so today, I want to talk about the question of community ownership and open data, and asking where is the balance. Uh, but before I start, a lot of people ask me about my slides. I like to share them. So they're, they're under a CC license, Creative Commons license. Uh, just attribute them to me once you use them. Uh, the URL uh, is right there if you want to download the slides. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm sure you're shocked and surprised. I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm hoping that together we will be able to uh, explore the idea with the, with this community of practice, uh, who I'm sure all of you are uh, have some kind of experience in archives and spatial data and uh, any combinations thereof. Uh, before I start, I want to frame uh, my talk in this uh, using this quote, uh, as I'm sure a lot of you know the. Uh, Armenian genocide is a, genoc is, a, is a genocide that happened during the Ottoman rule, and uh, uh, and it continues to be until to this day denied by Turkish authorities. And uh, Erdogan uh, continues to state that there is no evidence of the genocide in the archive. Uh, of course, this is not recognizing that the archive is not censored is censored rather, and. Uh, uh, and I want to quote uh, something that Garo Pailan, who is a member of parliament, uh, who is Armenian uh, in the Turkish parliament, uh, he said that every Armenian from Anatolia 
is an archive, a document. My archive and my document were my grandmother, Sira Anoush. In the house of Sira Anoush, every grandchild was told about the great disaster. And if you're ready to listen, we can tell our document. And of course, a fist fight ensued in the, in the parliament uh, after stating such, uh, such a grand uh, statement. Um, and this is not just the, ca the case in, uh, in, in Turkey, also here in Canada. I am based in Toronto. Uh, uh, indigenous nations have been talking about residential schools and the murderous practices that were, <laughs> that were happening in the in residential schools for decades. Uh, in, uh, our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has acknowledged the, uh, the, the, the harm that has been done uh, officially, but he continues to fight those, uh, uh, the, the, the survivors of the, of the residential schools in courts right now as we speak. Uh, so I want to kind of uh, uh, relate uh, the quote that I, I just stated from uh, the MP uh, to another quote by Antonio Gramsci. Uh, he, says, he states that the starting point of critical elaboration is the consciousness of what one really is and is knowing thyself as the product of her historical processes to date, which has deposited in you an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory. And what uh, uh, Edward Said quoting this, uh, this uh, 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 this quote from, from Gramsci says, is that our task as historians, as archivists, as practitioners, um, is to create that inventory. And I have a link in the, in the, in the uh, slide notes to the YouTube video where he, the interview where he states that. Uh, it's a really fascinating interview. I highly recommend that you try to see it. Uh, so it goes without saying that what, uh, uh, reading archives is done in two ways. So we, we uh, there's everything that is, that exists, uh, and a very small fraction of a fraction of that is what is documented, and a fraction of a fraction of that is what we archive. And maybe there's a, even a smaller circle within, within that that says, uh, that is, um, uh, that is what is accessible within what we archive. Um, and in archival practice, we talk about uh, reading archives in two ways. So we read the archive in what it contains, and we also read the archive in, uh, uh, in what it does not contain. Um, and uh, uh, this is what some, like one way of reading against the archival brain. And we ask ourselves, uh, uh, like, what, do this, what do those archives repre uh, represent? Do they represent our diversity, the, the diversity of the communities that, they're, uh, uh, that they reflect? Uh, but also we ask ourselves, is representation what we actually need? And, uh, and I'm not just talking about content, but also about the governance of the archives, so, and especially spatial archives. So I'm talking about what technologies do we use? Is, are they open source? Are they not? Uh, what licensing tools do I do we use? What kind of collaborations do, is, are there in the, between the community and the archive? Who has access to the archive? How is the archive? How does the archive seek to activate its content uh, uh, by collaborations with scholars, with the, uh, with practitioners, with community members, etc. And uh, and then we kind of narrow that question to uh, those questions to, to the spatial aspect. So why do we map and for whom do we map? Um, and those questions kind of reveal certain power structures that underlie the archive. And, and through that, they inform our underlying, uh, uh, the underlying question of community ownership. And what I want to do through this, uh, through this short talk is to kind of show a series of examples that illustrate the significance of those questions and some possible responses. Uh, and underlying all of, these, uh, all of these examples that I'm talking about is, is, a, is the question of knowledge production and power relationships that uh, are within. Um, so, uh, the first example that I want to talk about 
uh, is from a community that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. It's the OpenStreetMap community. Shortly after, shortly before actually the revolution in Lebanon in October 2019, or the uprising rather, uh, there was a series of fires that engulfed the entire east coast of the Mediterranean. And I was living in Beirut at the time, uh, doing my master's and uh, uh, and there was a real lack of uh, of building data in the uh, in the areas that were affected. So what we were asking, can we get a, a map of all of the buildings that were that are at risk of the fires uh, so that first responders can use them? Um, <clears throat> and uh, so in collaboration with Mark Ferra, who's, uh, who's a friend and uh, a colla long term collaborator of mine, uh, we activate. We asked the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team uh, to do. A, it's called an activation, uh, and we asked people from all over the world to start drawing the footprints of the buildings that they can see in specific areas that were affected by the fires. And we were able through that to collect about uh, the foot, building footprints of about eight, uh, ten thousand eight hundred buildings within a few days. And uh, but while we were trying to to to, uh, to think whether or not we should make this call to collect the data, we were asking um, who will use this data and uh, and for what purposes. Uh, we know that real estate developers really value uh, building footprint data, especially in countries like Lebanon, where data is scarce and difficult to reach. Um, uh, uh, but we also know that a lot of urban planning students and uh, and in Lebanon, the, the urban planning, the intersection between urban planning and activists uh, and urban planner and activists is very is very large. Uh, urban planning students have a lot of difficulty reaching and accessing data. So uh, uh, and uh, 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 spatial data in particular, which means that a lot of their research is narrowed down in places where you can get the data, which means Beirut, the capital city. So a lot of peripheral places like the, the mountains have very little scholarship done on them, partly because of the lack of data uh, and accessibility of the data. So the call that we made eventually was that uh, even, though the, like, even though it might help the real estate developers kind of demolish the forests that are in existence and demolish the natural environments there, it actually is a very important thing for us to, uh, to, uh, to, to, public, to make sure that this data exists for people who need it. And, uh, and the map is also available. You can scroll around with it. It's also in the uh, slide notes. Uh, Another example, which is it's an example that I love because it involves a lot of youth in the south of Lebanon in a Palestinian refugee camp called Burj Shmali. It's actually not like it's it's like tens of kilometers, not more, uh, from the Palestine-Israel border. Uh, uh, and what happened with an NGO called Greening Burj Shmali is that they worked with youth who uh, flew aerial. Uh, uh, air, uh, aerial uh, balloons uh, to take aerial photography of the, of the camp itself to create the first uh, 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 publicly accessible uh, aerial uh, image of the, of the camp. Uh, after a lot of work and, uh, uh, and collaboration and trial and error, they finally created this big mosaic, very high resolution imagery of the camp. Uh, they submitted it to the popular committee, uh, which is, supposed to represent the interests of the camp, but that the popular committee blocked the publication. They eventually were able to create a, a, like a more GIS map as, as opposed to an aerial map that they were able to publish, but the aerial imagery was not published. And the, the justification for that was that it's possible for Israel to actually use this, that, uh, uh, use this imagery because it's such high resolution to, uh, to, to, to harm uh, the Palestinians who live in this Palestinian refugee camp. Uh, the question of who is the popular committee is another question. The popular committee is uh, is a is a structure that uh, is a, that governs every camp because camps, especially UN managed camps, uh, fall outside of the jurisdiction of the state of Lebanon. So they have their own popular committees uh, that govern the camps, and they're usually got. Uh, 
they they're usually governed by the Palestinian factions, uh, official parties, and they are, and in a lot of uh, places, those factions don't actually represent the interests of the people who live there. Uh, so the question is, who is benefiting from not publishing the uh, the aerial imagery? Is it uh, uh, and I. I'm pretty sure Israel, Israel flies uh, very high imagery drones, uh, high, high resolution imagery uh, drones that collect much higher resolution than what the the the, uh, the youth were able to collect in Burj Ishmali, but uh, they were not able to uh, publish that data. Uh, and I wonder who is being uh, who's losing the most here. Um, Another example is uh, iNaturalist, which is kind of like uh, the repository for uh, open data uh, about plants. Uh, I know I work with the with the, with the researchers in Palestine in the, who are who collect uh, data about indigenous plants in Palestine, and they want to contribute it to open data sources to open data repositories like iNaturalist. And if you see here in the map that I'm showing you, there is uh, there is some interesting observations that one can make. Uh, one is that uh, there is, uh, if you can see where my mouse is pointing, there is a lot of uh, uh, gaps in uh, in where the data is collected. So here we can see that the certain sections of the West Bank and Gaza have a lot of gaps in them, and that's the areas where supposedly the Palestinian Authority governs. But there's also a very high intensity of, uh, <laughs> of activity in places like the Golan Heights here in the, north, uh, in the Northeast, which is uh, illegally occupied territory of Syria occupied by Israel. Um, uh, uh, so the question of indigenous data uh, plant data, spatial data in uh, in Palestine and historic Palestine uh, becomes complicated because who who own who owns this data and who uses it? Um, we know that Israel, uh, the Ministry of uh, I think Environment, uses uh, 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 justifies its uh, its ban on Palestinian collecting uh, uh, wild plants in Palestine. Uh, on environmental grounds. So I wouldn't be surprised if data from uh, sources like Ant Naturalists are used to informing that policy. Uh, to, but that policy we know is also designed to repress Palestinian rights and add their access to Palestinian rights and their access to lands. Uh, uh, and then there's also the question of who, who, who is able to create to do the research and who produce uh, who produces that knowledge and who gets to publish uh, based on that knowledge? A lot, I know that a lot of Palestinians don't want to contribute the data to iNaturalist because uh, uh, they don't want Israeli academics to use that data uh, and publish uh, uh, based on the data that they have produced. It's further form of exploitation. Uh, Uh, another example that is very dear to my heart and it gives me a lot of, uh, 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 it, it always bugs me, is the United Nations uh, Conciliation Committee on Palestine, which is a committee that was created very early, uh, immediately after the Nakba or the catastrophe uh, of when the, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine happened and the uh, the ethnic cleansing of about 700,000 people and the destruction of 500 villages and towns happened. Uh, uh, the, the archive was collected by, uh, uh, through the uh, UN agency and it covers about 20, uh, it gives, it shows land deeds and land uh, ownership inside about 25% of what is now uh, Israel proper. Uh, and uh, through the years, there was access given to those to this archival data, but only to state entities. Uh, and uh, uh, when the Palestinian Authority was created through the Oslo Accords uh, in the 1990s, 
uh, uh, a copy of that archive was given to the Palestinian Authority th through the Institute for Palestine Studies. Somehow a copy of that archive was given to uh, reach the Yasser Arafat Foundation, um, which in turn, uh, in response to the so-called deal of the century by Trump and his friends, uh, uh, and in protest to it, they made the, uh, uh, they allowed any Palestinian to uh, to inquire about the data inside of the archive. Uh, so they have, uh, you can submit uh, your ID and a query about a specific piece of land and they will try to find as much information about it for you. Um, uh, which is the first time that this kind of data has been accessible to the public. And the question is, uh, 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 and one of the reasons why this data was kept private uh, is because it was supposed to serve as a as a negotiation tool uh, in the final status uh, questions. So, what happens to the Palestinian uh, property uh, that was stolen in forty eight? Who? What happens to the Palestinian right of return? And the question and the the justification that was used by the Palestinian Authority is that using uh, providing Palest private land claims by Palestinian uh, like if Palestinians start using, uh, presenting private land claims in Israeli courts, uh, it will kind of erode the, the collective right of return by Palestinians, which is guaranteed under, under international law. But 70 plus years on, the, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, 30 years after, after the Oslo Accords, I think the Palestinian Authority has lost any legitimacy at uh, representing Palestinian interests. And I think it's a uh, this kind of archive is our national heritage, and uh, uh, and it should be accessible by us. Uh, the final example that I want to bring forward is this Palestine is my project that I've been working on for the past few years, uh, with uh, in collaboration with my co uh, partner and co-founder of Palestine Open Maps, Ahmed Barkley, uh, and the support of various uh, organizations, including the Basel Khartabil Fellowship and uh, uh, and Visualizing Palestine. Uh, it started with uh, the Palestine Exploration Fund map that uh, actually I got through, or we got through the, uh, the David Ramsey map collection. Um, and, uh, and the survey of which kind of, it's this survey of Palestine, this map, which was the first survey map of Palestine, was done by the British in the 1880s. Uh, and then that data and that survey was kind of evolved into uh, the, the survey of Palestine maps, which, the, which were done by the, during the British mandate of Palestine in the 30s and 40s. Uh, and I got access to see them at the British Library. They're kind of really beautiful documents. And uh, what we've done in, uh, with Ahmed uh, is that, we, uh, we combined all of these map sheets, uh, 155 of them, into one giant massive map sheet. And you can scroll around with it and see it as a slippy map. Um, and you can see it on palestineopenmaps.org. Uh, uh, but the, the process from, through which the, the map reached this, uh, uh, this, uh, the Palestine Exploration Fund map to being online in the form that you see it on paloopenmaps.org uh, is a bit is, is really interesting, and I want to kind of take it take us through the stages of that. Uh, the uh, uh, the first map was done at at the like one 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 inch to the mile, I think, scale, and the latest maps were one to twenty thousand scales. Mm. So. Uh, these uh, these images are from uh, Dov Gavish's book, uh, The Survey of, uh, of Palestine Under British Mandate, 1920 to 1948. Uh, and they show you kind of like a progression of what happened in, uh, in, the, uh, in the collection and the mapping of uh, and creation of this survey. Uh, it started uh, with uh, British survey on British, British surveyors only, and it's uh, who in very quickly realize that they don't know enough about the land to make the survey. Uh, 
and they uh, they quickly enlisted the help of uh, uh, Palestinian and uh, Palestinian surveyors with, with who they trained actually. Uh, so there were, I think, two different schools that trained the uh, uh, Palestinian surveyors, and uh, uh, and like a lot of the work was done, or most of the work ultimately was done by them. Um, and uh, uh, Salman Abu Sitta, who's the, the kind of like the godfather of uh, of this project. And who's the intellectual like parent of a lot of Palestine mapping projects? The uh, uh, he says that there are few countries in the world in which surveying and mapping played such an important role in its history. Palestine, the Holy Land, has long been coveted by foreigners, primarily Crusaders and European European colonists. They wanted to know its physical and historical characteristics as a prelude to cover, to, to conquering the land. Um, and one really interesting example of that is the case of Norman Qasatli, who is uh, who's referred to in the archives as the uh, as uh, uh, the Damascene scribe. Uh, and uh, uh, and this photo was given to us by uh, by me and to, uh, to me and Ahmed by uh, by not by Salman Abu Sitta himself. Where it's a document, it's a it's his notebooks, uh, and in it there's the transliteration between Arabic and English of the Palestinian of the locale names, and it's obvious from the archives that he's done a lot more than just being a scribe. He was he's he's an essential critical part of the creation of the art of the survey, and through that I asked the question, who is the owner of this archive? Uh, where did the labor come from, uh, and where did the knowledge come from? Through Palestine Open Maps, there is uh, uh, one way to present those maps and those data is through physical artifacts. So uh, Salim loves to talk about the primacy of paper of uh, over uh, the pixel, and uh, uh, and here's an like an, uh, Salman Abu Sitta actually created the Atlas of Palestine, a very massive document of 700 pages. It weighs about four and a half kilograms or nine and a half pounds. Uh, it's a very intense document, very expensive too. Uh, the on pa through Palestine Open Maps, I've done I do this this other approach, which is to put them online and try to kind of extract the data and make it as accessible publicly as possible. And the way I do that is through mapathons. Uh, here you can see anyone who's used the OpenStreetMap ID editor can recognize this interface. Uh, I'm using the ID editor to extract data out of the historical maps. Uh, and I do that through by running these big mapathons. Uh, we can I've done 23 of them so far. The next one will be tomorrow as a part of the under map spaces workshop. And uh, and I've done them in different places ranging from Palestinian refugee camps to the British Library. And uh, and the data that we've collected that, that we've extracted so far covers most of uh, the area of Palestine, it's it's a lot of data, and we're still there's still a long way to go. Uh, and I want to highlight two examples of what of uh, of 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 who participated in this mapathon in these mapathons. The image to the left is a mapathon that I did in Badawi refugee camp in the north of Lebanon, and. Uh, it, most of the uh, the mappers or the participants were uh, Palestinian Syrian refugees who became again refugees in Lebanon. And uh, for anyone who knows anything about Palestinian refugee camps, is that every street, every school, every library, every pharmacy, every uh, clinic is named after a Palestinian village that was ethnically cleansed. Um, and uh, but. And for anyone, I also grew up in, in Yarmouk camp in, in Syria, uh, and I I attended those schools. I attended Kaukab school, but I didn't know what Kaukab looked like. I I, I lived on uh, Khalil Street, um, uh, but I didn't. I don't know what Khalil looks like, um, and uh, and that's it's the case for every Palestinian, not every Palestinian, but a lot of Palestinians out there, especially those who come from villages as opposed to larger cities. Um, 
uh, and here you can see the especially this guy they were so excited to see the finally that their villages in uh, are artifacts that represent their villages um and uh, and we can be very sure that when the british uh commissioned this uh, this uh, this uh, this map this map survey they did not have in mind the the, the affirmation of palestinian refugee uh, 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 claims to the land and the other mapathon that i would uh, that i ran that really stands out to me was happened in kitchener uh, my canadian hometown uh, and it's uh, here you can see three of my favorite people in the world uh, my uh, my little sister in the foreground my mom and my grandmother uh, my little sister who was 14 at the time she was my technical assistant she knew all of the things to know uh, she helped me out she would go around and helps uh, and helping uh, all of the mappers uh, my mom coordinated the, the space, made sure that uh, uh, the, like that we booked the space, that we had the publicity, etc. And my grandma would ask, what, what is Teta, my grandma, doing here? And she, she was an essential part of the mapathon because a lot of the place names that are mentioned in the maps um, are, uh, trans all of the place names are transliterated from Arabic into English. Uh, and what Teta did was help us reverse the transliteration. So I don't know how to. Uh, it's it's uh, it's often for someone whose ear is not trained uh, in in the place names. Uh, it's quite difficult for them to miss uh, uh, like to 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 miss reverse transliterate miss reverse transliterate. Uh, but for Teta, it was just a snap, right? Like it was very easy. And I think it's another example of how Teta uh, uh, is kind of contributing to the to the indigenization and the and the uh, changing kind of the ownership of the data uh, and of the of of, of the maps. Uh, so I ask myself, who owns this data? And to me, the answer is that all of the contributors of Palestine Open Maps, but also. Uh, all of the Palestinian people. And, uh, and I know that this data has already been used in research uh, by, uh, uh, by a lot of different people in, uh, and scholars. Uh, among them are, uh, are people in the audience right now. So uh, the final question that I wanna, or final set of questions that I wanna ask is, are we are we being gatekeepers uh, to our data, or are we being custodians to our data? Uh, and there are examples of, uh, of of where either is a, is a useful approach, um, but I feel like that we, that we should err further on the side of uh, uh, custodianship than ownership, because none of us can claim absolute ownership to the data. And the final question, set of questions that I want to ask is uh, undermapped to whom and overmapped by whom? And that's it. I'm happy to answer questions. I hope there's a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that uh, illuminating talk. It really, I think, uh, exposes uh, a perspective uh, that, you know, in the balance of things, it's really important to get all perspectives. So I appreciate the talk very much. Um, um, I, uh, I'm going to, uh, while I wait for uh, questions, um, I, I thought of one to get us started. And uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of the scale of, of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mapathons. Um, so, you know, in just in terms of, you know, how many people were were able to. I imagine this was all over uh, different places, right? I mean, you showed us a couple of pictures. Uh, different people were doing this all the time, and how and and what's the status of this mapathon? The the, the map based on the mapathon now and that sort of thing. Maybe talk a little more about that. Yeah, um, 
so I've done 22 mapathons. Uh, the smallest mapathon would be about like 10 ish people. Uh, the largest would be about 50 ish, uh, 50 to 60 people. Uh, the audience is extremely varied, like I showed, like you have youth from uh, refugee camps, but also just uh, like map nerds uh, <laughs> uh, from, you know, University of Cambridge in the UK, right? Like uh, it varies a lot. And I and part of the reason why I chose to use the OpenStreetMap toolkit to uh, or the infrastructure of OpenStreetMap that I deployed on my own server, separate from OpenStreetMap. So it's just, it's the same infrastructure, just on my own server. And thanks to being, thanks to the open source uh, uh, nature of it. Uh, part of the reason why I chose to do that is uh, because the OpenStreetMap community has put in a lot of effort into optimizing the tools for beginners uh, and creating also a set of tools for advanced users at the same time. So you can, you can be, like the most, uh, like you can have no introduction to any web mapping, online GIS, anything, and you can still participate in the mapathon. And if you have a lot of experience in in, in mapping and so on, you can uh, you can still contribute. Like you can download uh, Josem if you know that, and you can just like run with it as you wish. And all of the tools that are applicable to any tool that's you can use with OpenStreetMap, you can also use with Palestine OpenMaps. Um, yeah, just to just to follow up really quickly on that. I mean, so uh, I know I've been involved in mapathons before. Uh, so did the, especially the kids, I'm really interested Did they did, do they, did they do coins, lines, polygons? Mm -hmm. um, you know, did they map the whole, whatever they knew or how did they, yeah, just a little yeah. more. The kids, I it was really fascinating. I that was a little bit, it's one of the highlights of <laughs> of my uh, uh, of my career. Honestly, it was uh, uh, they. I I first pointed them to go to particular their own villages. I told them like you your grandparents have told you about your village. Uh, you've heard about it all your life. Go to it and try to map anything that you see there. It was still earlier on when we when the map was not as crowded, so it was easier for them to map. Uh, I usually give as a beginner task uh, to to mark the built areas of uh, uh, so the buildings as much as possible and the roads. Uh, so uh, there was one uh, one pair of uh, <laughs> uh, of youth who I think they they mapped the entire road going from their village all the way to the lake of Tiberias. So they just went, to, followed the line. It was a very long highway. <laughs> uh, uh, and like with it, they visited all of the villages and the towns along the way. So it's kind of like, it's a close reading of the map that you wouldn't get uh, in, in, other, in other circumstances. Great, great. Yeah, no, this is great. Um, I think you've answered this uh, already, but uh, uh, this is from Karen Pinto and she asks, uh, would love to know more about the map thons. I think you've answered some of that already. How are the maps created? You did that. Um, uh, but this is an interesting question. How were unknown places identified? And I think for me, one of the things about map thons is where does the quality QA, you know, quality assurance, quality control happen? And, you know, usually they're experts and say, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, yeah. So if you want to say a little more about the identification of places and. Yeah. Uh, quality control is actually it's really uh, it's really interesting. Uh, uh, it, it, I know that there is a lot of errors in the maps uh, in the data that we've extracted so far. I know that there, we need to do some quality control work, uh, uh, and the good thing is that OpenStreetMap community has done a lot of uh, has put in a lot of effort into creating quality control tools. Um, my next major project is I'm trying to find funding for this. Uh, is to get uh, is to pay someone to help me set up the. Uh, uh, the it's called a pack. It's a, there's a package called OpenStreetMap Seed. Uh, OpenStreetMap Seed OSM Seed, uh, that basically sets up the entire infrastructure of OpenStreetMap. Uh, it's all online on GitHub. I can post it, the link in the chat, uh, and. Uh, 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 and I think the, uh, 
the open OSM seed uh, has a component which is called the, the tasking manager, which has been uh, a very useful uh, tool for people who work like when we did the activation in, in uh, for the, the building footprints following the fires in the, in the mountains of Lebanon, you do an activation and it leads you to the tasking manager. It breaks up the entire map into a grid uh, of squares. And you can say the task for this square is to uh, verify that you, all of the roads are mapped. Mm -hmm. uh, and then like one mapper does the actual extraction and then another person goes in and there does the quality control and then you can pass mark that square as done so i want to install uh, i want to set up the tasking manager because i think it'll make the mapathons much more systematic and easier uh, and the data more reliable as we go on in the future yeah that's great okay uh, uh yeah go sorry i don't want to cut you off. i just wanted to make sure that i answered the question of uh, unknown places identified. yeah yeah, uh, yeah sorry. I'm I, actually Karen. Maybe you can uh, like refine this question a little bit. I'm not sure what you mean by unknown places, um, but uh, if we already answered your question, then great. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe we can get back to her while we look at some other questions. So Moiser has a question. Uh, he thanks you for the talk, and uh, he is. He says that he is. Um, uh, I'm intrigued by the point you made about your grandmother and the reverse transliteration. So I'm curious if you're linking the data sets you developed to other similar projects. I'm thinking about tapping into gazetteers or providing an API, et cetera, or is that implicit in the OSM substrate? Yeah, actually, this is a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very important point and dear point to my heart because it's. Uh, I'm glad you asked it, Monsieur. It's a. Uh, I the, the the whole point of this data is to be able to link it with other data sets. So I know that there was one person who is uh, who's who used some of the data in. He he was doing a research uh, on the the census of. Uh, uh, there were five censuses, I guess that's the plural, uh, of Palestine done before 48. And he was doing, using this data to kind of cross-reference the, the, uh, the district boundaries uh, uh, between uh, our map set and the district boundaries as defined by the, the census, because this, the, they evolved between the Ottomans and the British, and even the British, the, the two different censuses that they did, they have different uh, district boundaries. So uh, that's one part. The other part is that I've kind of, uh, uh, I, we found a gazetteer uh, published. We haven't been able to find an Arabic language gazetteer um, from the era. Uh, but if you know of one, I'd love to, to see it. And I, I do want to kind of make, uh, like publish a gazetteer based on this data eventually. Um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, like the, just the data like, will be useful in so many different ways as we go on. Like I can share with you a slide that I was planning on uh, showing for tomorrow in the Mapathon. Uh, like this is the work of Ahmed Barkley, my partner in the project. He, uh, at, with, the, with collaboration with the Art Jamil Foundation uh, in Dubai, uh, he printed the entire map set as a complete map set and he's like on vinyl and we, we pasted it on the floor and you could walk on the map. Uh, and it was just, just such a different way uh, of, of navigating the entire map. Here we are just sitting uh, on it. Uh, uh, it. It just gives you a different reading of the, of the entire space. And you can also uh, see these blocks. Uh, I'll send a link to them later and I'll paste the link in the chat. These blocks are artwork made by Ahmed and Marwan Rashmawi, who's an artist. They took the, the maps that, uh, and the map data that we've collected and they uh, used the, they, they projected it on a terrain map, uh, 3D terrain map, and they used uh, a CNC machine to kind of carve out that terrain on, on wood blocks. And they're selling them as fundraisers 
for uh, for visualizing Palestine. Uh, they're really beautiful artifacts, and I think uh, 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 they wouldn't be possible without the data that we've kind of extracted out of the maps. Thank you. Uh, that was a, a good, extensive answer. Um, <clears throat> next question is from my uh, Susanna Crum. Uh, she asks, I'm really interested, again, it goes back to the mapathons. I'm really interested in the social aspects of a mapathon. Do you find that in-person gatherings work better for this kind of work rather than something more anonymous slash separated slash digital? Is the social aspect something that projects like OpenStreetMaps loses or lacks? And I think we just showed both examples. Yeah, I, but tomorrow's mapathon will be the first mapathon that I run entirely digitally. Uh, there were, the participants will be on like scattered all over the earth. Uh, uh, I'm curious to see how that goes. I've been very hesitant to run mapathons digitally. I don't want to do it, <laughs> uh, but I think it'll, it'll be nevertheless interesting to do it uh, as an experiment. Uh, I, I really value the, the mapping together uh, aspect of, of mapathons uh, because the mapathons are not just to me, and this uh, the mapathons are not just about the data that we extract. It's also about the conversations that we have as we're extracting the data. Uh, there is also a very important intergenerational aspect of the mapathons. So the, uh, it wasn't just you if that were attending the mapathons. It was also uh, older folks like my grandmother. Uh, there was the the mapathon that I ran in Toronto. There was a one woman who came. Uh, she was in her late seventies, early eighties, I guess. And she she asked me to find a school for her in Yaffa, and uh, and I found it for her. And I asked her like, why why are you interested in this school? And she said, oh, this is my school uh, uh, <laughs> back in the day. And this is uh, like this kind of interaction you wouldn't have in in a digital in, in a digital environment. Um, in the in the in person environment, we also I can show like I get print printouts of the maps and I show the people the like the physical artifacts. Um, it's just a, it's a different uh, form of interaction. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so next question is from Arena, and uh, the question is, uh, well, the comment and the question, thank you for your wonderful work and encouraging and, and empowering presentation. I would appreciate your advice on how to connect with communities to serve their needs for claiming their places. Mm. For example, with tribes that are not recognized by government, how do you build the trust and relationships with their leaders. How do you ensure that there's no harm from using the open source tools for mapping their sacred places, uh, spaces? Excuse me. Yeah, this is the million dollar question, right? <laughs> uh, that, uh, I think like the, the first question I would ask is like, why do we want to map those spaces, right? Uh, who is being most served by mapping? And if we if we have a good answer to that, I think it will not be difficult to convince uh, whichever tribe or uh, community that you're you're referring to. Uh, to it won't be that difficult to convince them to to sh to to make that uh, uh, mapping possible. Uh, I would say, uh, uh, like, it make sure that you have you've answered to yourself why you're mapping before you uh, you approach the, that question to uh, approach those like those communities with that question. Thank you. Um, so the next question is uh, from Zaina and uh, the question is, I, I'm interested in the question you raised about protecting data against those who might abuse it. What are methods you have adopted or have seen adopted to protect data which could be used against the people it sets out to help? Using the same example in your talk, if you were to, if it were up to you, would you have published the map, the Palestinian refugee camp, and how would you have done it? Uh, for the Burj Ismaili 
map, I yes, I would have definitely published it. I know like Israel is flying drones over the refugee camps all the time. They have high resolution imagery <laughs> of everything. Uh, I'm not I'm not gonna deprive Palestinians from have, seeing their own camp from above just because Israel might use it. Punct. Uh, uh, but uh, there a, a very interesting approach that I've seen um, being used uh, uh, is done by a, a Maori community. I try, I'm trying to remember the name. They created their own license. Uh, uh, and by a, it's a group called uh, Te Tehiku Media. Uh, and they've kind of created, they, what they do, they don't work with spatial data, they work specifically with linguistic data. So they've compiled a big corpora, uh, corpus of, uh, of linguistic data uh, uh, of their language. And, uh, and what they've done is that they used, uh, uh, they've created a new license uh, that's called the, uh, excuse me, I'm going to butcher the, the pronunciation. Kaitiaki Tanga license, uh, which is based on the, the question of, or the, the form of custodianship that I mentioned earlier. So they, uh, they say that it's an open license, so you can use the data, uh, uh, but you have to consult with the custodians of the data. Um, who have collected this uh, linguistic data from uh, from the Maori community, um, and the, uh, uh, so the Maori community has entrusted the uh, uh, this organization uh, to 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 be the custodians of this data, and this custodianship is in, uh, 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 and this trust relationship took a long time to develop. Uh, uh, and it was it was built by the members of the community themselves, and the idea was that they didn't want. It's usually Australian companies that come and use the data to create language teaching software that they sell back to them <laughs> to to the folks uh, that they took the data from. Uh, so they didn't want that to happen. So in like in cases like this, they would have to. If you want to use the data in such a in such a way, you would have to ask the the, the community uh, for permission to do that, uh, and it's based on this custodianship model that has historical precedence in uh, in Maori culture and Maori communities. And uh, uh, and I like I I've, I've been I've been toying with the idea, a very different idea. I call it the the data wakf. Uh, and if, if anyone knows the, the term wakf, it's kind of like, it's a rough equivalent of, uh, of, of a trust, a, uh, a land trust. Uh, it's been it's a, used as a legal tool in, in the Middle East uh, for a long time, especially in religious institutions. So there is an Islamic wakf, there is a Christian wakf, there is a etc. And, uh, and each one of those uh, uh, communities uh, 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 entrusts the, the land to a certain authority to take care of it. And I think there could be an, a similar example of, uh, of entrusting the data to uh, a community that will kind of take care of it in a similar way. I hope that answers your question. Um. That's great, yeah. Because um, I I uh, I also remember walks in, in in Bangalore, where I'm from originally, mm -hmm. and what they did uh, is really I think there's definitely a transferability of these of these uh, uh, functions. So they would do uh, uh, they would do Muslim marriage certificates, for example, right? Uh, and that would be recognized by the government and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So. I can see that happening here uh, with, with the data. So that's, I think that's, uh, I think it's worth uh, pursuing. Um, the next question is uh, also about Mapathons. It's uh, by Laura Rubel and she asks, uh, I haven't participated in a Mapathon yet, but my experience with being involved in datathons and hackathons 
has been that there are valuable outcomes even beyond the development of the software or data set. For example, the relationships development or skills and confidence gained by participants. Um, and of course, you've answered some of this already, but what have you seen in your work? Uh, what other outcomes should we recognize and value? Absolutely. This is like the core question of my PhD, so, but I'm still at the very beginning. Uh, but like to me, the mapathons are uh, uh, kind of like I said, they're, they're the, the physical in-person aspect is super interesting. I've seen like the intergenerational aspect I mentioned earlier, but I've also seen intercommunal aspects. So uh, there have been uh, like uh, mappers, participants in the mapathon who are from different Jewish communities across the world where I've done this mapathons who have come in and they said that this is kind of um, their way to help indigenize those maps, uh, give them back to the Palestinian people. Uh, the uh, uh, of course, like skill building, I've like uh, I think it's a very important uh, aspect. Uh, like I've learned a lot through those maps, but I've also uh, uh, the, uh, like the questions that come up, especially with the youth, uh, about like what does it, what does this, what does this map mean? How do you even read a map that's his, that's a historical map? Uh, like what. Uh, like the lay of the land. I think all of these questions I try to kind of address and play with in the mapathons and uh, 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 and that's precisely why I choose to do like at the very beginning before I started doing the mapathons and I was thinking about that extraction, I thought about uh, doing machine learning and there was a few attempts by different people to do machine learning on the maps uh, to extract the features. And eventually I was like, actually, the mapathons have a lot of value beyond just the data that we output. Uh, 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 and I want to kind of explore the, the decolonial or the uh, 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 or indigenization uh, potential of, uh, of those maps. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, I, I'm not going to pronounce this name, but we got uh, one of the attendees ask, how can one reach out to folks for the mapathon you organized in Kensington, Canada? In Kitchener. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Kitchener, uh, can, right? Yeah, yeah. So the person, uh, I, I mean, just reach out to me. My email or my Twitter is Mejdal. Uh, my email is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll throw my email here. Hi at najdal.cc. Here it is. Oh, it's really easy. Uh, I I can connect you. Uh, Great. Um, uh, let's see. I got. Uh, let's go. Uh, uh, Karen has uh, um, gone back to her original question, um, and uh, she says, "I hunt unknown places." Um, on medieval maps, uh, my work is on academia, she says, uh, sometimes I go to ground to find a place, especially if information is absent in the sources. So I was wondering how it works in reverse, sort of like reverse transcription. Yeah, so it's actually interesting. I, I've never been to Palestine since I started this project. I have a dream about, I was supposed to go in uh, in December, but uh, there was the lockdowns and nothing. <laughs> I don't even know if Israel will let me into the country. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I do, I know that I like, uh, one of the things that people have done inside, map, inside Palestine is, uh, there's one researcher, uh, what's his name, Tarek something, I forget his last name, this is embarrassing, uh, who does, uh, who goes with uh, people like me, the descendants of Palestine refugees, uh, and helps them find their homes in the, uh, the like in the villages or in the towns that, that they were originally from, their grandparents' villages. And uh, uh, there is, like there's definitely like a compare contrast and a lot of detective work that they that you have to do 
And uh, we know for sure that the maps are actually not 100% accurate. Actually, Salman Abu Sitta, I think, is working on a book where he is kind of compiling errors in the maps um, uh, and the artifacts uh, <laughs> that are uh, just like topographic errors or uh, and so on and spelling errors. And, and so there, I know that uh, there's a lot of hunting that you have to do <laughs> and that's part of the fun, right? That's why we do it. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. So I, this is uh, I, there's a, a, a question by Moiser. Uh, I think he is referring to the slide where you're sitting on this large map um, and uh, both you and your colleague. And I think the question is, is each block of the map as, is it a whole or is it a one tile per page? I mean. I guess he's trying to figure out the makeup of that map. It looks like a jigsaw puzzle of sorts. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, we did. Uh, 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 I think each each block is uh, uh, is a is a is a map sheet basically. Uh, so I sent. I I just threw the the link to uh, the Instagram account where we show. Uh, how how the what the blocks look like? Um, uh, yeah, so each block is one map sheet. Uh, and thank you, Tar uh, Faris, for uh, Tarek Bekri is the name of the of the guy I was mentioning in the earlier question. But yeah, each block is one map sheet, uh, and uh, and it has the topographical. I think we multiplied by ten uh, the topography to just exaggerate to be able to make it a little bit more visible. Uh, and yeah, like the link that I just sent you has a lot more detail on them. Majid, I think it'd be it'd be worthwhile to just go to the Instagram page and and uh, I mean the wooden oh, yeah. Uh, yeah you know it's worthwhile looking at it. There's some fascinating photographs here. Um, yeah, this is the beautiful work of uh, of Ahmed and Marwan Ahmed Bartley and Marwan Rishmawi, um, and uh, you can see yeah. Kind of the, like the, the the topography, the one of the really nice uh, coincidences that we found while creating the prototypes uh, is that we you can use this I mean uh, plywood uh, and we if we first started with just solid wood blocks and then when we tried with plywood uh, we realized that actually you can you see the contour lines as the CNC machine cuts cuts through the wood because the plywood has plies and each ply is kind of like a, a layer. Uh, so all of these lines that you see on the map, they're just the I color of the plywood. Yeah, uh, maybe we can see closer. Uh, let me that see particular one, yes. Instagram oh, one. Got, oh, don't worry about it, sorry. <laughs> sorry. That's uh, okay. I haven't used Instagram. And I closed my account in protest a very long time ago. <laughs> uh, but I think you can, let me see. Uh, I think you can uh, see this the, the zoomed in version on the store where you can buy them. Sure. Uh, there you go. Yeah, they're looking at art here. Oh, that's fascinating work. Um, so here's the zoomed in version. Uh, yeah. I love the texture that the plywood gave the, those maps. So this is the first exhibition that we did in. Uh, in Dar el Nimr in, uh, in Beirut. It's a, an art gallery in Beirut. Uh, well, was that to scale? Uh, go back one, one. Uh, that's to scale. Are those, are those spots uh, where you have the 3D and then the rest? Yeah, uh, so I just remembered. So uh, apologies. Each one of the blocks is a quarter of a sheet, okay. uh, one fourth of a sheet. And each one of those dots is the location of a village, an ethnically cleansed village in Palestine. And uh, the squares that you see on the ground are the, the, the map sheets uh, themselves. Wow. Uh, and uh, yeah, so they're very, very beautiful artifacts. Yeah. Here, I think we made, we didn't make every single uh, sheet into one, but uh, here you can see the, like the buildings themselves uh, in this, in this uh, image, you can see the buildings. 
uh, and the roads that we kind of extracted from the data. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Majid, for that. That's uh, so. I think uh, we uh, this would be um, uh, a good time to conclude. Um, I we uh, I want to thank you again for for coming on and and uh, uh, you know eliminating uh, this part of the world. Uh, and um, I'm sure the uh, students tomorrow are going to benefit. Uh, from your um, workshop. And um, with that, thank you again. And with that, we will close. Um, I will see you all tomorrow, at the same time at five o'clock. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Uh -huh.